I have two seconds to read um, something from the whistleblowers about CGS? Yeah, we have about two and a half minutes. Okay, so this is part of why we're doing the initiative. This is a quote from whistleblowers at CGS right now. Senior plant management continues to tell the organization and public how we are an excellent performing nuclear power plant while ignoring the precipitous fall of our industry standing by measures of reliability, equipment health, radiation protection, and recent increase in significant human performance events, um, uh, including a level one clearance order failure, a loss of diesel generator operability due to human error, and a slip and fall by a supervisor resulting in an injury. The plant ranked 88 out of 99 plants. Radiation exposure was the third worst among boiling water reactors and equipment reliability, put at a 97 out of 99 plants. Oh my God. That's direct from seven whistleblowers at CGS who are still right now anonymous and going after the ownership at Energy Northwest. Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission. That's F-I-S-S-I-O-N, since that's the age we're now living in. I want to thank you for joining us uh, today. And as usual, on Wednesdays, we have interviews with really awesome activists. And today we have uh, the honor of having Mimi Gurman from Radcast.org and No Nukes Northwest back on the air with us. Uh, we have a lot to discuss, so I'm going to introduce her right away. Mimi, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your time and efforts. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, uh, you know, this is really awesome. Uh, I'd like you to share a little bit of, you know, one of the things that you and I've been talking about is this, uh, I, I kind of like to jump into the 350.org conversation since Bernie Sanders has appointed him to be on some delegate committee at the convention. Uh, I about spit nails when I saw that because uh, Bill McGibbons is out there saying that uh, nukes, that nuclear power is an alternative to fossil fuel, which is completely insane. So I don't know how about you, but I'd like to put that on the table uh, first. How, how, how do you feel about that one? Sure. I'm always down for talking about Bill McKibben. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, this whole idea that uh, we have an environmental activist who's out there telling us post Fukushima that we need to be relying on nuclear power as an alternative off of fossil fuel, uh, it lets me know that he's probably paid for by somebody who, with an interest. In, you know, the whole energy industry is probably paying for his efforts. It's com completely hypocritical to me. I don't know. How do you feel about that? Well, I saw something at one point about who does pay him, and he does receive money from um, lots of different groups of people. And, you know, he, I, I, I don't think that anybody who gets paid to speak about the environment is really worth listening to anyway. I, I really kind of do believe that. Um, I know I'm sounding slightly shaky about that statement, but... Um, what does that but, mean, you don't think, if they're speaking about the environment? If they're, if they're speaking, um, if, if, if they're an environmentalist and they're talking about um, ways to pull off of different bad, um, you know, bad fuel, bad, you know, getting off coal, getting off fossil fuels, and they're talking about nukes at the same time as something that we should you know, look into and stay with and stick with the program for a while, there's no way that anybody should listen to them at all. So I'm talking about those people. And there are quite a few of those people out there. Mm -hmm. And it's just a sign. If somebody is using nukes as something that is uh, worthy, just leave. They're not <laughs> listening to. And, of course, they're getting paid by somebody to promote that stuff because it's just a – It's it's not a – it's wrong. It's just wrong. And anybody with a brain and a mind and a, um, a, a desire to save the planet could hear that. And, and if you can't, then I have to say you've probably been listening to Bill McKibben <laughs> for far too long because Bill McKibben is the guy. He's the guy in the environmental movement who tells people that we should depend on nukes for at least five or ten more years, at least, while we pull off fossil fuels. And he makes it sound so uh, believable 
and um, people fall for it. And I'm, I'm still, we've talked about this before on your show. I, I can't figure this out. I can't figure out how, you know, Sally walking down the street, she loves the earth. She does things for the earth. She, um, you know, does her best at trying to figure out ways to make things better. And she's a part of 350. And when you talk to her about shutting down nukes, she says to you, oh, no, we need to keep nukes in order to get off fossil fuels. It's like they're brainwashed by this man. And somebody doesn't know better. And I'm going to give it to the activists that they don't know better. And Bill McKibben is the reason. Do you think that he does not know better? He, I mean, how could anybody who's really an environmental activist, this is my thinking, he's he's an environmental activist. He has to see the statistical data about the harm that these nuclear power plants are causing. Every single community, there's an increase in cancer, childhood leukemia. I mean, there isn't a single community where there's a nuclear power plant that is unaffected. Yeah, it, I- You have to look at people's teachers. And again, back to people who follow 350 as well. You know, look at your teachers. Um, Bill McKibben had a teacher. You know, his teacher is um, somebody who um, really promotes nukes as clean and green. And when you listen to people telling you that nukes are clean and green and you don't know anything about nukes, which is like 99.9% of the, you know, human species don't know anything about nukes. Um, it's it's going to get in your head that nukes are clean and green because it's just what, you know, somebody told you that. So I, mean, I actually thought that. I mean, really, honestly, I can look back five years ago not at all being freaked out by nuclear power and thinking that it was probably going to be the alternative future. I really believe that. I, I, I have a challenge for everybody listening to this. And it's a challenge because it involves reading, actually reading a book. And um, I know people don't do that anymore. It's like, you know, books are like dinosaurs. I read books and I love books and I promote books. Um, The book that I'm going to give everybody as a challenge to read is called um, The Menace of Atomic Energy by Ralph Nader. This book was written for you. It was written for me. It's Ralph Nader talking to you and I about how nukes work in a way that is so easy to understand. It takes all of the garbage around this clean and green thing and has you going, wow, why didn't somebody tell me this before? Well, Ralph Nader actually did. He wrote it in like 76 or 77. Um, He's been saying this for a really long time. And I'm in the middle of this book now and I'm loving it because even though I've been studying nukes for five years, well, my whole life, but really studying how nuclear power works now. Um, It's been helpful to me. Read the book. Stop being somebody who doesn't understand nukes. You can understand this. Right. Right. And I, I, I encourage you, understand it so that you can go out and be a teacher to some Sally on the street or some Joe on the street who loves the environment and thinks because they listen to Bill McKibben that nukes are green and, and, and clean. You can be their teacher. Another thing actually that is really important to understand in educating yourself is that a lot of the students are being misled in their universities. I came across a young woman at a Bernie Sanders rally here in Eugene who told me that nuclear power is fine and that the United States just needs to catch up because France has learned how to remediate the nuclear waste. And I'm like, where did you hear that? She's like, we were taught, she goes, that that we just learned that in school. Now, somebody in school told her that lie. They probably watched Pandora's Promise, and it's a PR movie about um, nukes. And it's made to look like it's not a PR movie, which is why it's a PR movie. And um, it's all propaganda, and it was made by the nuclear industry. Did they say in that movie that France had a way to remediate the... I can't remember all of the things that they've said in there, but if you Google um, all of the lies from Pandora's Promise, I think it comes up. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. 
Well, that was really stunning for me. And I, I, I've come across that a couple times where people actually, you know, that's one of my, I mean, I'm going to be transferring to the University of Oregon. One of my real focuses is trying to crack, put a crack in the solid wall, the pro nuke solid wall at the University of Oregon, because they really, I have taught even Mary Woods at the environment, she's the environment, she runs the environmental law division. She just doesn't see it as such a big issue. And so I, I, that's one of my cracks while I'm there. I'm going to be there probably four years, and I'm going to be actively engaged in that one. But let me, let's me let talk about what you're doing with uh, No Nukes Northwest and your initiatives to close down and your efforts to close down the Columbia Generating Station because you and your organization have made monumental efforts across the board in really even activating people like myself. I live in the Northwest, and I am actually going to be – bringing myself up to Washington in the next few weeks uh, and get, walking around and getting signatures. So why don't you explain what you're doing in this effort to close down the Columbia Generating Station to keep our country safe? Well, all of this, these efforts began in 2012 during Occupy and Occupy Portland um, came together and took on a lot of different um, projects, really, a lot of different issues. And one of the issues was in the environmental aspect was um, our nuclear, well, it was Hanford, really, and the nuclear dump. And from Hanford, we, we, we took that to the streets up in Hanford. We went to ground zero. We went to Hanford and held a really huge rally in 2012 to expose the truth for the public at large, not for the area, which is called Richland or Tri-Cities, um, they know. They, they're, they're a community that lives in denial, and we weren't there to change their minds. We were there to just bring the focus to where um, Nuclear Central was. And I call it Nuclear Central because this was part of the Manhattan Project. So this all began in 2012. And... Um, Helen Caldicott came and Sister Megan came, who just got out of jail. Many of you, um, I'm sure, are familiar with Sister Megan um, for uh, breaking into a nuclear plant and spilling blood. You're talking about Sister Megan Rice. Yeah. So Sister Megan was there. She spoke. Anyway, it was a big deal. So right after that happened, I went to, um, I, I thought, well, what would it take to shut down the nuclear plant, which is on Hanford's property, but not Hanford itself. It's an actual nuclear power plant. And so I went to Lloyd Marbet in 2012 or 2013 and asked him, Lloyd Marbet took, took part in shutting down Trojan nuclear power plant, which is closer to Portland. And I said, Lloyd, is it possible to shut down CGS? And he said, well, it is possible because it's actually people owned. You know, the people just don't know they own it. So if the people knew they owned it, I said, they probably wouldn't want it. They just don't know they own it because they don't know there's a nuclear power plant because that was the whole idea when it switched names from whoops to um, um, uh, anyway, it, it's part of a longer story. But the name nuclear power is no longer part of the, the name. So the, the people don't know. So Lloyd said, yeah, it's possible. So. I started back then with a group of people trying to shut down CGS and we decided that it would be good for the Seattle city council to take a resolution that we wrote to shut down, to agree to shut down CGS. The Seattle city council is in charge of the largest PUD in Washington state, which is Seattle city lights. So if the Seattle city council was on board, then Seattle City Lights would really be made to pull their vote. They have one vote among 28 other votes or 27 other votes to pull their vote from um, CGS to help shut it down. Well, the resolution was brought forward and um, people were afraid that the language was too strong. That language being, this is a resolution to shut down CGS. Now, resolution is not a law, um, but it would have been a, a good statement. Well, in the meantime, years passed, and here we are today. Yesterday, the resolution passed wow. unanimously in the Seattle City Council. Um, even Shama Sawant, who runs the Energy Committee of the Seattle City Council, agreed that the resolution's wording has been completely watered down and is no longer very strong, but was told by activists that we can still use this, you know, and move forward with it, which we can. 
So it's positive. It could have been a hell of a lot better and stronger, but it is what it is. So we've succeeded in that. So now there is pressure on Seattle City Lights now to pull out their vote. With that pressure comes pressure from activists to the other public utilities in Washington to um, also pull their votes from allowing CGS to continue to run. So that's one method of our strategy is to, as a, in a domino effect, start with the largest PUD. They'll pull their vote. Other PUDs can follow that. And we need a two-thirds majority of the votes to win. So that's one full strategy. The other strategy that I had was let's create an initiative so that the people in Washington actually know that there's a nuclear power plant through the initiative and in the process can sign the initiative to get this on a ballot to let the people vote for or against CGS. So the initiative is to actually get this question on the ballot. Should CGS be shut down? And the answer will be overwhelmingly yes, if we can get the signatures. Mm -hmm. um, the problem has always been, which I recognized early on, that the people in Washington do not know there's a nuclear power plant. And anyone you ask, unless they're from 350, <laughs> anyone you ask will say, wow, I didn't know there was a nuclear power plant. And of course it should be shut down. When we meet people from 350 on the street, they're the ones who say, oh, no, we need nuclear power while we pull off fossil fuels. And then, of course, there are the people whose family members work at either CGS or Hanford, and, of course, they're not going to sign. So um, that's where we're at right now. Um, the resolution was a success, um, a, a watered-down success. The initiative is active right now. We're having a strategy meeting on that um, this coming Saturday on ways to make this more effective. And... Um, that's, that's where we're at. And No Nukes Northwest has been the backbone for every single thing that has happened in the process of shutting down CGS. And no one would know that because other groups take the hurrah. So other groups, go ahead, take the hurrah. We just need to get this thing done. We need to shut down CGS. Mimi, let me ask you a question because, um, you know, in – Researching on Columbia Generating Station, I had read in an article that the licensees had lied to, on their application about the earthquake faults that was underneath that. Is that a correct statement? Because I had read that, uh, you know, when we've discovered all these earthquake faults, uh, in this article it said that the uh, there was no mention of an earthquake fault on their application, even though they knew there was an earthquake fault. Isn't that enough for us to go to the NRC and say, wait a minute, this thing probably needs to be closed down? They lied on their application? The NRC doesn't care. In fact, the NRC almost encourages lies. So um, there's nowhere to go for those kinds of things. There's only expectation of the same. And mm -hmm. the reason that I say that is you can expect a nuclear power plant to lie about anything and everything. And you can expect the NRC to cover it just like a Band-Aid, you know, or cover it with a veil so that there's even more of a um, um, darkness between the NRC, the nuclear power plant, and us, you know. So there is nowhere to go to get truth from anything other than to know the truth and get the people on board to shut this, to shut down nukes. And the two ways that are most effective in this are either through the money end, because the, the money that nukes cost is astronomical and the people pay for it, whether the nukes admit to that or not, the people pay for it. And the other thing is the destruction um, that nukes cause on communities, you know. So either, either of those two factors are how we go after nuke plants. The yeah. unspoken harm is so unbelievable. Like the doctors, there's no epidemiological studies being conducted. No one's keeping track of the harm around nuclear power. We've seen this in St. Louis. There's just, there's no tracking the harm. And when there is, like up in Richland, when they had all those microencephaly babies, uh, you know, the government comes out very quickly, immediately, and says it's not caused by nuclear 
uh, the, the nuclear waste. So we're, we're very much abandoned, and we really do have to uh, hold hands together and stand up to this mega power that is oppressing us. I mean, it, it is so oppressive. Like when, you know, $2 billion going into Hanford every year and then Columbia Generating Station right next door. If people would understand how close that nuclear power plant is to the Hanford site, they would be completely freaked out. Well, the thing is, is that CGS is on Hanford's land. Um, it's on the Hanford Reserve. It's on the nuclear dump. And, you know, it's... When you, when you drive in, on one side of the road, you'll see empty, like, just dirt. And that dirt is radioactive dirt and supposedly, in some areas, supposedly remediated. But we have already found, I have already found with my Geiger counter that it, it has not been remediated. Um, and then you'll see buildings, which are part of the failed WHOOPS project, which was to make many nuclear power plants uh, the largest bond default in the United States. We got money, Hanford got money to build nuclear power plants, and um, none of them were completed. All of them had begun, but none of them were completed. All of this, billions of dollars went into this, and... Only one made it, and that's the Columbia Generating Station. Wow. And all of the others, though, cost all of this money that was supposed to have been paid back, and um, it couldn't be paid back. To date, it's still the largest bond default in the United States history. So anyway, when you go drive in the road, you've got these abandoned buildings. You have Hanford um, buildings on one side. You have... Um, unfinished nuclear buildings on the other side. You have a working nuclear power plant, which is the Columbia Generating Station, with, um, you can see the, the um, waste towers there, and, and then more Hanford. It's all on the same property. I mean, very close. That was the shocking, you know, Kevin Finnegan and I drove up there to, uh, on your suggestion, it was a great idea, kind of nerve wracking action, but it was break free, no nukes <laughs> Northwest. And, uh, you know, our videos were like the Keystone cops. We were bumbling all over each other. We got very nervous when we saw the police sort of helicoptering us. You know what I mean? They'd park in one place and then they'd park in another place. And then they, they, we were out there for maybe 45 minutes and it was just, we got so nervous. But it was shocking to see the decrepit state of this. And the, I mean, that desert out there is poisoned. You can see that it is uh, dead. Like the plants are like frozen in time brown. It's, it was the most eerie thing I'd ever been in. And yet, there's a whole community there that works there, lives there, and is in a com sort of numb. It, it's, it's like uh, reminded me of what you like the Stepford Wives, you know, in that old movie, the Stepford Wives, you drive through town and everybody has that sort of blank stare on their look about the obvious, right? Very much like that. It It is really stunning. I mean, for those of us who... I don't even know like it took us six hours to drive there and it's this idea that you would think that the Columbia generating station is really far enough away from Hanford that if there was an emergency the the people who are managing the emergency could handle it but nothing is farther from the truth could you explain why that is well in order to um use nuclear power you have to have a water source and um so the columbia river is right there which is now completely polluted and it's been polluted since the 40s uh with plutonium and everything that comes with plutonium there's hundreds of other incredibly toxic radioactive uh, radionuclides and that's in the water it'll be in the water for hundreds of thousands of years and um so, you know, when, when the Manhattan Project was looking for a place to land, they didn't take into consideration that um, just because you can't see people, people don't exist. And those people who lived on that land and who still live on that land were, are the native people. There are many, many tribes that are part of um, the eastern Washington, eastern Oregon um, area 
in western Idaho. Um, and all of these tribes were affected. So the Manhattan Project said, look, nobody lives here. Let's do it here. And there's a water source. So then, yeah, so they threw everybody out, you know, um, they, you know, it was just, you can read all about that. We shouldn't take the time on the show to talk about that because you can just look up the Manhattan Project. There's so many histories about that part of it. But, um, yeah, they, they killed the land. They killed the river. They know intentionally what they're doing. This is the thing that shocks me more than anything. This is not an accident 70 years later. It's not like they don't know. It's an intentional disregard for life on our planet. And every week that I do this radio show, I'm just still nonplussed at how people can go to work every day and ignore the facts that they're causing massive harm to our planet. It, yeah. It, 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 it stuns me. I'm completely stunned by the denial of the people who work at the people who work in the nuclear industry and the people at the top, like the head, the EPA, the, I mean, the, you know, this was an, a shock for me. Uh, Mimi was, I recently realized, and I mean, I've been paying attention to this for several years, but it kind of stunned me. And it was through your work that highlighted it, to be honest, that it is the EPA who takes the radiological testing of how high the radiation is. The NRC does not do that, correct? No, that's not a job that is tasked for the NRC at all. The NRC um, is an offshoot of earlier um, so-called watchdog groups, you know, from the government to look over itself. It's like the banks regulating the banks. Um, and the name changed and it became the NRC. And its job is to be notified by nuclear power plants when something goes wrong and then to make the nuclear power plant, which has told it when something goes wrong, to fix it. Um, it's it would be laughable if it wasn't so dangerous, but it's incredibly dangerous. And whenever anything goes wrong at a nuclear power plant, it's just a matter of steps before a meltdown. And that's the truth. You know, people like to um, say that that's an exaggeration. It's not. Um, once the moment that a nuclear power plant is turned on, the moment it's turned on, it starts to decay the wires start to decay. It gets, it gets this, this, this thing that happens is neutron bombardment. And neutrons will just, they'll hit everything and anything, and they wear it down. And so the concrete gets worn down. It gets thinned out. It gets cracks. So the building, the foundation, the walls, um, cables, um, anything metal, in there. I'm talking like nuts and bolts. I am not kidding. Nuts and bolts. They get worn down. And as soon as the initial switch goes on, so it's different from many other kinds of things that we think about, you know, that have a, um, a lifespan that isn't very dangerous. Um, I'm not thinking right now what that might be. Well, like a steel mill. You know, when you have a steel mill, you build it together and the nuts and bolts don't just fall apart because the steel mill is operating, right? It, it wears down out of normal wear and tear of the use of the steel mill. But with the, the nature of the nuclear power, the nature of the nuclear energy is that it breaks down everything, no matter what, it's indiscriminate. That's why it's so massively harmful. They're breaking the atoms apart. And when you have... Um, boiling water reactors, which is what Fukushima is or was, and what um, what the Columbia Generating Station is. The job of the plant is to boil water, and the steam creates energy. And what happens is the radioactivity gets held in the water, and then it steams out. And um, every time the power goes down and every time the power goes back up there is a steam event and you know radionuclides go out in the steam there are weak filtration systems in some of these plants they're not made to um to prohibit radionuclides from leaving the building the filter the filtration is there to attempt to catch particles 
to hopefully let them decay a little bit before they get kicked off of the charcoal and then sent out. So, I mean, all kinds of the most nasty things happen at a nuclear power plant. So for somebody like Bill McKibben, who is now going to be on the Democratic Convention platform, you know, talking about the environment. What worries me is, here's a guy, um, Sanders is anti-nuclear. Um, I'm sure that Sanders could even be better at what he already knows, because anybody can get better. I, I try to get better at what I know every day, because there's always something more to learn. And I'm sure Sanders is willing to do that. McKibben, however, let's say that um, Sanders doesn't win the nomination. But Bill McKibben is there. And Bill McKibben has the time to put on the platform. We're going to stick with nukes for 10 to 15 more years while we pull off fossil fuels. That is a, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on your show. That's a fucking probability. That is a probability that will happen. You know, that McKibben would do that and put that on the platform. And that is what I'm scared about, that that's going to be on the platform. Now, is that better than Hillary's pro-nuclear agenda? Um, it's basically equal. There's not even a lesser of two evils here with that platform. Keeping nukes around for five to ten more years in order to come off fossil fuels is a ridiculous statement. It doesn't make any sense. You do not keep nukes commissioned while you do something else. Nukes need to get decommissioned. It's a long process. Well, what's really amazing about that idea that we could lean on nukes is that uh, in the first place, it's not even acknowledging the fact that the, just to have the nuclear power itself, it has to use fossil fuels. That's the insane part about it. Fossil fuels are used in massive amounts in the uranium mining. Think of how, how much fossil fuel is used just to bring whatever they need to do to get it to there. And the process of managing the waste uses tons of fossil fuels. So the whole, you know, just transporting it back and forth, the billions of gallons on these big gigantic cargo ships, all, it's just insane, the whole insanity that relying on nuclear power is lessening our burden on fossil fuels is really a straight up lie, I think. And you know, what's interesting. I was thinking about this the other day. One of the processes in, in creating nukes and using um, uranium for nukes is yellow cake. We went to war. We're still at war in Iraq for George Bush and W and his people scaring Americans into believing that there was yellow cake being transported in Iraq, you know, which would mean that they could create pellets for nuclear fuel and nuclear weapons. Um, we went to war for that because, oh, no, there's yellow cake, which wasn't even true. And here in the United States and around the world, we are mining uranium in order to process it to make yellow cake to use in our nukes in the United States. I mean, think about that. Yeah. Yeah, I really do think about that. And this is the issue is like most – I think the, one of the best things that McGibbons does is keeps people from even thinking about it. His blanket statement that nukes are an alternative, this is the one thing I don't know, and I, and I don't know enough about him because, frankly, I haven't really followed him. He's a bit annoying to me. Uh, what is the position that he has on, uh, instead of nukes, why isn't he promoting wind or solar? I mean, why isn't he saying we need, I mean, we could ramp up the wind and solar just like Germany did within, boom, a few short years and be done with all these poison plants that we have around the country. To me, I'm no expert on, hold on a minute. Yes. So this is Mimi German joining us uh, from No Nukes Northwest, and we are discussing 
the reliance on the, quote, environmental uh, activists on nuclear energy, which is just completely an oxymoron, if you ask me. You can't be an environmentalist and promote nuclear power. That's how I feel. That's right. So back to Bill McKibben. Um, I, I, I was saying I'm not an expert on who or what he is. What I know about him is he's a leader um, in the environmental movement. He is looked up to by governments around the world because of what he says about what we need to do and what is. And when you have someone like that who is promoting nuclear as a, as a hand holder while we do what is right by getting on fossil fuels and not including nukes in the fossil fuel discussion, he becomes the most dangerous man to me in the entire environmental movement. Governments, Bernie Sanders just made him the guy to come onto the platform of the DNC, like to head up the environmental issues that we, quote unquote, we, the progressives want. Fuck that. We, me, I, no nukes Northwest, do not believe in Bill McKibben's approach to the environment. He does not speak for us, actually. And this is the hard part is I think the, one of the most dangerous parts about what he's doing is he's misleading a lot of young people who are now actively engaging and deciding to get actively engaged because they're freaked out about what they're seeing. He's convincing them that nuclear power is just not that bad. I mean, it's just not that bad, and that's the danger about what he's doing. And I, it has got to stop. He's got to stop. He's, he must change his attitude on that one. And so, uh, you, you know. know I, I wasn't sure if um, Naomi Klein, who was also on the board of 350, I wasn't sure about a year and a half ago if she also felt the same way. And um, when her book came out, she clearly does not feel the same way. She understands nuclear power. She understands that nukes do need to be decommissioned and they are not something that should stay online. So I just want to be clear about that, that um, when, when you talk to people from 350, and I encourage people to do it, remember that you can't get angry at the people who are brainwashed. You have to go to the person who is doing the brainwashing, you know? It's like going to somebody who's been abused and yelling at them for staying in the relationship. It's just, it's not going to, you know, it's, so, not right. yeah. it's a complicated thing. And so it is best to, you know, I, I always share, I always, every time I see a 350 table, I always go over and I ask them where the information on no nukes is. And they look at me with a blank stare like somebody who's been brainwashed and they said, well, why would we have that? We're dealing with fossil fuels. And my response to that is, well, let's start with uranium mining and all of the trucks that are necessary for that. And when we remove the uranium from the ground, who is being affected and who's being killed and whose children play in the, the pond tailings, you know? And, and I just tell them the history of how we make nukes. And I don't yell at them. Then I tell them, your leader has misled you. Bill McKibben is incorrect. Now you are incorrect. And if you would like to correct your, your you know, mistaken reality, by all means. Um, but don't, don't get mad at them. They don't know better. They've been brainwashed. But please do go after Bill McKibben. Now, has, has anybody ever really challenged Bill McKibben publicly, you know what I mean, to say, hey, why are you behind nuclear power? Has he ever had anyone on any interview show or anything say, well, in the face of Fukushima, how can you possibly support the idea of leaning on nuclear power? Has anyone ever asked him that in any of these alternative radio stations he's gone on? As far on? as I know, there's one, one person, and... Um, I'm looking it up right here. I keep it in my emails. Um, here it is. There was one interview that was done, and it was in the um, on the Daily Beast. And they they did a series of short little videos. And one of the videos asks him his view on. I'm looking at it right now. Hold on. I'm just pulling it up. Grandchildren, what do you say about climate change? 
help the environment? What do you think about Obama? Oh, what is your opinion of nuclear energy? And so if you go and you look up the dailybeast.com and plug in Bill McKibben, what is your opinion of nuclear energy? I'm sure it will come up. Um, and it's called like Ask Bill McKibben Anything. And his response in that, well, I'll just let you go there and look it up for yourself. It should irritate you. It should make you angry. It should make you frustrated and it should make you activated. I, I want you to be activated to shut down a nuke plant. Um, to talk to people, to stop this lie, this perpetuated lie. Um, it's one of the, I think it's the biggest lie in, of, about the environment that we have. And it's not just perpetuated by him. I think he's one of the main leaders who, who um, is the, the teller of the tale. You know, he was told the tale. And he gained a stage to tell his tale more loudly than others. But there are other people who tell the same tale. So, you know, do something about it. Well, I think people just do not comprehend the total level of control that the nuclear industry has over all the messaging across the board in the media. Bill McKibben's, in my view, is kind of like the highlight of how they manipulate the message. For some reason, he's been misinformed and bought out because if he had any conscientiousness towards himself at all, he would have read this book by Ralph Nader, The Menace of Atomic Energy. He would have read Dr. Goffman's book. He would have read Helen Caldicott's books. If he'd read any of those books, there's no way on earth when you read the facts. I mean, John Goffman himself said when he wrote this book in 1972, the government knows that for a population of a million people, for every two rads in the air, they already acknowledge we're going to have 32,000 extra leukemias and cancers every year and up to 200,000 childbirth defects every year. For two rads in the air for a population of a million. That was written in the 70s. Those statistical facts are not changed because that's what radiation causes the harm to the population. And we have, I actually read that this week that in the, in our country right now, we have over 225,000 reported cases of microencephaly in our, in our country right now. And microencephaly in my view is not, I, I would love to see the report and the mandate by the World Health Organization on how they created this study that said the Zika virus causes microencephaly because what I did when that story first broke, as soon as I heard it was produced by the World Health Organization who is censored by the IAEA, I, in every one of those little cities, I just copied the name and wrote nuclear after it and Googled it. Every single one of those South American cities, uranium mining had just started in 2012, 2013. Out of the 4,000 cases, they studied only 18 were the microencephaly cases were with people who had the Zika virus. So I this whole thing of taking the focus off of, because we're now having such massive nuclear waste harm to the human population, we're having an explosion of microencephaly. And no one's thinking beyond, okay, what did the World Health Organization, uh, my guess is that the IAEA said, go find out why we have this microencephaly down there, but exclude nuclear harm from it. You cannot discuss any uranium mining or any exposure to nuclear waste. That would be my guess, but because we're not entitled to read their scientific studies or how they get funded or what their mandates are, none of that background information is known to the general public. Well, check this out. Um, in the process of following yet more leaks from CGS, uh, recently, I had to take time to debunk a story that's been traveling around that this particular spike on an EPA graph um, very recently was due to Hanford's tank leak. Mm -hmm. And um, I looked at the report that this, you know, um, RT reporter put out and I said, you know, to myself, this he, he's done no research on this, you know, at all. You can't base anything on one EPA graph. So anyway, I, I went in and did research, and lo and behold, between March and May, um, CGS has been leaking. 
Wow. And um, meaning radio, uh, radionuclides have been escaping from CGS into the environment. And this has now been proven um, with the work from myself and another citizen scientist who feeds me EPA graphs. Um, so in the process, I've been talking with a man from Union, for, uh, Union of Concerned Scientists, and um, he's the person who looked into the research that I had done and called me to say, yes, in fact, this is what happened, and this is why it's happening, so now you understand. So now I understand. And he sent me this email, and he said, you know, I was telling him that I, I felt very strongly that even if a nuclear power plant isn't, doesn't scram, you know, because something super bad has happened, but it does power down in order to fix something and then power up again, which are these times when radionuclides escape the filtration system and go out, that the communities should be, should be told, you know? And this is not what happens. Communities are not told when so-called, quote-unquote, testing is being done. And... Testing is just a code word for something has gone wrong at a nuclear power plant, folks. They, they don't really test. They, you know, people actually sort of stop testing once Chernobyl happened because Chernobyl happened because they did this really, really dangerous, unprecedented test. And what happened was Chernobyl blew up. So, um, the, yeah, the, the term testing at a nuclear power plant is really... Um, it's code for something is wrong. So anyway, I said, how can we get communities to, how can we make the plants tell the community? So he wrote me this email. And he said, about a decade ago, the NRC created a web page with links to radiological effluent reports. We now, I, I know about these reports. These are called effluent reports, and anybody can find them on NRC pages under effluent reports. Um, so then he says, the NRC took the step in reaction to reports that most U.S. plants had illegally leaked and spilled radioactively contaminated water into the ground. So again, just to recap, the reason that the effluent reports became a thing is because it was a reaction to people saying that new plants are illegally leaking. So they say, okay. Fine, we'll release an effluent report. Um, but then this person says to me, those reports spurred then-Senator Obama to introduce a bill requiring owners to report leaks and spills within 36 hours. That bill did not pass, but the nuclear industry, quote-unquote, voluntarily agreed to report leaks and spills of more than 100 gallons of radioactively contaminated... Oh my God. Within three working days. Okay? So now, first of all, again, recapping, what that means is when we get the word through the NRC event page that there has been a leak, that leak is, has to, from them is over 100 gallons of radioactively contaminated water. Okay? So just, just to be clear. Now, wait. The, the letter goes on. Dave, says, Dave gives me a bit of strategy here. He said, it might be possible to complement the quote-unquote voluntary reporting of water leaks and spills with mandatory or quote-unquote voluntary reporting of unplanned or unexpectedly high releases of radioactively contaminated gases. Now, he doesn't tell me how I can do that, but he says maybe that's something to put forward, you know. So what he's saying is, Yes, you want communities to know about this. Yes, communities should know about this because, yes, radioactivity is releasing from the nuclear power plant into communities via either groundwater or up into the air via steam, okay? And I want communities to know about it. He's saying, well, maybe we can make that happen. So next on my agenda, now that the initiatives are out, is to um, – go to some NRC meetings and bring this up to them directly, which they will laugh at, and then take this to communities. So I am going to figure out a way to get people to come with me to communities to go to community meetings and show them the proof that CGS leaks, you know, a few times a year, whatever it is, just bring the proof and say, don't you want to know about this? And get some community pressure 
to um, make this happen. So that's, that's next on my list. So Mimi, let me back up. So you're telling me at this point right now, the way it is set up right now, when there's a nuclear waste, we don't know about it unless it's over a hundred gallons. Yeah. You don't have to. You, you so if they spill 50 gallons into the community, it's like, hmm, nobody needs to know. We're on a need to know basis and we don't need to know. Yeah. Wow. Or, and the or, NRC or, thinks that's or, perfectly or, acceptable. Or if, that amount, or if that amount goes out into the air. Same thing. It doesn't have to be in the ground. It can be any, any amount of water that is going out that is under 100 gallons. Wow. Well, look, we have about 10 minutes left, so I want to get to two points here. First, uh, can you address for about five minutes how the, this mindset – that basically nuclear pollution just is not that harmful because I think that's really a lot of what we're facing as activists to close this down. People look at us and say, you know, people are just, I mean, the lying by the World Health Organization, by the NRC, by the CDC, by every agency in this country about the harm. Look at St. Louis. The government is telling them, well, we need more studies. People are dropping off like flies. They're living right next door to a burning nuke dump site. So can you address how we can move past, I mean, in your mind, how we, for just a few minutes, how we can move past this idea that radiation is just not that harmful? And, and then I want to get to the initiatives so we can end the show on that note. Yeah, what people need to recognize is how propaganda is fed to you. When you understand that, you understand that what you're hearing is incorrect. So I'm going to give it to you really easy. When um, I called up the Washington Department of Health two years ago regarding, Lonnie, what you've been talking about, um, the, the number of babies born with their heads open and their brains not joined together and their cranium not joined together is and it, it, it's it's an epidemic. And I called the DO, the Department of Health in Washington, and I spoke to them. I spoke to the woman in charge of that study. And I said, how did you determine um, that the study was poor people only and that they didn't have enough folic acid? And she told me, um, I, she, God, it's for another interview, but... Um, I said to her, did you look into Hanford? No. Did you look into the leaks that are coming out of the Columbia Generating Station? To which she replied, what is the Columbia Generating Station? Wow. She was in charge of this entire study. And I said, it's the nuclear power plant in Richland. She said, you mean Hanford? I said, no, I mean the nuclear power plant. She said, we don't have a nuclear power plant. I said, we do have a nuclear power plant, formerly known as Whoops 2. And she said, well, I didn't know that, and why would that matter? And wow. so, but what we do get, here's the PR, what we do get is everything's fine. And, of course, nukes don't do this. But what you have to remember is they don't do studies of did radiation do this? Those studies aren't done. So for anybody to tell you that radiation is safe or new plants are safe, you just have to keep remembering that nobody's done studies recently on this. The studies that were done, and there were studies done. Goffman did these studies. There are books on these studies by Goffman. Um, what we find is there is no safe level. There is zero safe level of radiation that comes into our bodies that may not cause cancer. What that means is any amount of ionizing radiation that gets into your body may cause cancer. So their statements are absolutely inherently incorrect. It's a lie. Exactly. Which is why I want us to talk about this initiative. Those of us in the Northwest really need to make an effort to get our bodies into Washington and walk the streets and get signatures on these uh, initiatives. So would you please explain the initiatives that you have and where people can find them and how they can print them out? We have about sure. four yep. minutes, five yep. minutes yep. left. Yep. Okay, so the initiatives are both to shut down, to get CGS on the ballot in Washington to let the people vote to shut them down. 
And the initiatives can be found on radcast.org. So it's R-A-D-C-A-S-T dot org. And there's a, uh, in the menu bar, just go to Washington Initiatives. There are two of them. It is I-855 and I-856. What I suggest you do, they're very, um, they're long pieces of paper. Get them printed out at Kinko's and they're two-sided. All the directions are there on Radcast. Put I-855 in the front, put I-856 right behind it. Go up to people in Washington State. Say to them, did you know we have a new plant? They'll tell you no. Oh, well, we do. It's terrible. It's like the one of the worst in the United States. It's leaking all the time. Would you like to try to shut it down? Sure. Okay, can you please sign both of our initiatives? Boom. It's done. They will sign it. <laughs> it's actually true. That's and the thing is, most people don't even know. I mean, most people are completely unaware that it's even there, that it even exists. Right. I mean, in Washington State, that's the shock. It's not like in other states where people aren't even paying attention. But in Washington, people are really just not aware that we have, that there is a nuclear power plant really less than 20 miles away from Hanford, which makes it even far more dangerous in my view. That's the urgency of it, is well, the locality related to Hanford. 